Zena Systems Fragments. War is God. Nick Land. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Colonels Chao Liang and Wang Xingxue argued that war was no longer about using armed forces to compel the enemy to submit to one's will in the classic Clausewitzian sense. Rather, they asserted that war had evolved to using all means, including armed force or non-armed force, military and non-military, and lethal and non-lethal means to compel the enemy to accept one's interests. The barrier between soldiers and civilians would fundamentally be erased, because the battle would be everywhere. The number of new battlefields would be virtually infinite, and could include environmental warfare, financial warfare, trade warfare, cultural warfare, and legal warfare, to name just a few. They wrote of assassinating financial speculators to safeguard a nation's financial security, setting up slush funds to influence opponents' legislatures and governments, and buying controlling shares of stocks to convert an adversary's major television and newspapers' outlets into tools of media warfare. According to the editor's note, Chow argued in a subsequent interview that the first rule of unrestricted warfare is that there are no rules, with nothing forbidden. That vision clearly transcends any traditional notions of war. How traditional are we talking? War is the father of all things, and of all things King, Alpha, Delta Alpha, Heraclitus asserts at the dawn of philosophy. There seems little indication of restriction there. Whatever the positive semantic associations accumulated by the word war, its most rigorous meaning is negative. War is conflict without significant constraint. As a game, it corresponds to the condition of unbounded defection, or trustlessness without limit. This is the Hobbesian understanding implicit in the phrase war of all against all, bellum omnium contra omnes, in which the state of nature is conceived again negatively through a notional subtraction of limitation. Treachery, in its game-theoretic sense, is not a minor theme within war, but a horizon to which war tends the annihilation of all agreement. Reciprocally excited mutual betrayal and departure from an implicit common humanity is its teleological essence. This is a conclusion explicitly rejected by Karl von Clausewitz as his treatise on war, even as he acknowledges the cybernetic inclination to amplification, or tendency to a limit, which drives it in the direction of an absolute. War is the continuation of politics by other means, he insists, because it is framed by negotiation, bookended by a declaration of war, and a peace treaty. According to this conception, it is an interlude of disagreement, which nevertheless remains irreducibly communicative, and fundamentally structured by the decisions of sovereign political agencies. Even as it approaches its pole of ultimate extremity, it never escapes its teleological dependency, as a means, or instrument, of rational statecraft. The reduction of war to instrumentality is not immune to criticism. Philosophical radicalization, alone, suffices to release war from its determination as the game of princes. The Clausewitzian formula is notoriously inverted by Michel Foucault into the maxim politics is war by other means. If political sovereignty is ultimately conditioned by the capability to prevail upon the battlefield, the norms of war can have no higher tribunal than military accomplishment. No real authority can transcend survival, or survive a sufficiently radical defeat. There is thus a final incoherence to any convinced appeal to the laws of ver. The realistic conception of limited ver subsumes that of war lawfully pursued with the latter categorized as an elective limitation. Chow's words bear emphatic repetition, the first rule of unrestricted warfare is that there are no rules, with nothing forbidden. The power to forbid is, first of all, power, which war, alone, distributes. Between peace and war there is no true symmetry. Peace presupposes pacification, and that is a military outcome. There is no authority, moral or political, that cannot first assert itself under cosmic conditions that are primordially indifferent to normativity. Whatever cannot defend its existence has its case dumped in the trash. Cormac McCarthy's Judge Holden provides us with a contemporary restatement of the ancient wisdom. Suppose two men at cards with nothing to wager save their lives. Who has not heard such a tale? A turn of the card. The whole universe for such a player has labored clanking to his moment which will tell if he is to die at that man's hand or that man at his. What more certain validation of a man's worth could there be? This enhancement of the game to its ultimate state admits no argument concerning the notion of fate. The selection of one man over another is a preference absolute and irrevocable and it is a dull man indeed who could reckon so profound a decision without agency or significance either one. In such games as have for their stake the annihilation of the defeated the decisions are quite clear. This man holding this particular arrangement of cards in his hand is thereby removed from existence. This is the nature of war, whose stake is at once the game and the authority and the justification. Seen so, war is the truest form of divination. 
It is the testing of one's will and the will of another within that larger will which because it binds them is therefore forced to select. War is the ultimate game because war is at last a forcing of the unity of existence. War is God. War is the truest form of divination it turns out, is the revelation of the eon.